Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm doing something different today. Forgive me for that. I just had to fix my camera for a second. There we go. Um, trying something different today. I want to go over some ancient texts. I'm going to see if I can do this more often, like once a week or something. And uh, just like look at this text. I know these are English translations. They're not. I don't speak Greek, so I'm not going to fluently read the Greek originals. But we have scholars that do translations for us, and you know we can just look at those. So this is. Oh, by the way, oh, I already see a super chat. I'm going to get to those in a minute. I want to do as many super chats as possible because that is how I get. You know, that is how I get paid. So appreciate those. I'll answer any of those, but I do want to sort of stick to a certain plan here. And I was thinking we can, we can read Plutarch's On Isis and Osiris. It is a crazy text with a lot of information. It gives us a lot of, it gives us a lot of information on what their religious world was like back then. Like this dude is, he's talking about Mithra. He's talking about Dionysus. He's talking about Kronos and Osiris and the Gnostics and all these different religions. And he's comparing them and contrasting them. And I, I just think there's not a better text that I can think of from like the first century, second century era that gives a better um, like explanation of what everything was like back then. So I'm going to pop this up right here, making sure you guys can see it good. And um, yeah. Yeah. I just had a couple of notes that I wanted to. Okay. So this is, can you guys see this? I'll, I'll see this. Let me see if I can. Uh, okay, cool. So it starts off. Now this particular translation is done by William Watson Goodwin. It's kind of old, but it's the only one I can get that I, I can pull up online. The one I have behind me, I was comparing it. That I have a newer translation from uh, like the 2000s, I think it was. And I was looking at some of the differences in some of the paragraphs. And it is a little bit different. It's not exactly the same. It's not drastic changes, but there are some, some definite differences in the text. I'll, I'll, get over, I'll go over some of those in a second. But it starts off. He says, It becomes wise men, Dame Clea, to go to the gods for all the good things that they would enjoy. Much more ought we when we aim that knowledge of them which nature can arrive at. And so he sort of sets the stage. He's talking about the differences. So the it's it's about Isis and Osiris. But he's talking about all the gods. He gets into all the gods in this. He's comparing and contrasting the roots of these gods. This is a really, really amazing comparative religious uh, text because it's, that's basically what it is. He's comparing the way that they worship Osiris compared to how people in the Fr people in Phrygia worship their dying God. Basically I'll get to that in a second. First thing I want to show you guys is, um, is this one right here? Number nine, it's about Amon. If you notice this, when he gets into right down here, I don't know if you guys can see it, if I can highlight it, you can see it. Okay. you good. Good. So he talks about Manetho, the Sebionite, thinks that the word Amon, which we derive Amon from, signifies hidden and hiding. But Hecateus of Abdera saith, the Egyptians use this word when they call anybody, any of the gods, for that is a term of calling. Hold, no, hold, this, is, this is where it gets crazy. Therefore, they must be of the opinion that the first God is the same with the universe. And now if you know the Egyptian pantheon, Amon is the head of, he's the head of the universe. He's the, he's the creator God. He's the father, if you will. He's the, he's the zoo. No, he's not even zoo. He'd be like Kronos. He'd be Anu. If, if you're talking about Babylon, he's, he's the head honcho, right? So therefore they must be of the opinion that the first God is the same with the universe. So he is like, the, the, he's, you know, the, what do you, the, the Greeks would call that the Demiurge. And therefore, while they invoke him who is unmanifest and hidden and pray him to make himself manifest and known to them, they cry Amon. So therefore, 
was the piety of the Egyptian philosophy about the things divine. Now, why am I jumping right to this? Why am I showing you this? I have a wild hypothesis. It's not even a theory. I shouldn't even give it that much credit. It's a wild hypothesis. I think that the word amen is a derivative of the root word amen. Now, you probably, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the comment. Just start piling them on me. But it means so be it. It means let it be. It means, there. like, I know, I get it. I, I get the word is defined that way. And it's sure, it's what it means now. But what I'm saying is, amen is not really a Hebrew word. The, so if we are to actually believe that the Canaanites were for a thousand years um, a colony of Egypt, which it was. Then we then we should also understand that linguistics are going to be we're going to have some similar languages language stuff, right? I'm not an expert in linguistics, but I, I'm you know like I said, it's just a hypothesis. Now, with that being said, in Egyptian, just like in Hebrew and Semitic, they don't have vowels. So the word, the uh, spelling in Egyptian is A-M-N. There's no vowels. Now, we heard what Plutarch is saying. When they call on any of the gods, they use the word amen to call on the gods. So I don't think it's that crazy to think that this word could have been redefined over time. So when the when the Hebrews or the Canaanites are, you know, furtherly distancing themselves from Egypt and making their own religion and coming up with Yahweh and Elohim and borrowing from the Babylonians. I think it's a possibility that this word trickled down and became so be it. It's a word that Plutarch is saying is a word that signifies hidden and hiding. And they use the term to call on the hidden and hiding. Now notice that we, when people use amen, they use it to they always use it in the in the in prayer. It's always at the end of a prayer or the beginning of a prayer. It's you're calling on di- the the deity. So I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. I just wanted to start 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 with some cl- start with some uh, some crazy hypothesis. But I, I've talked to other people about this, real scholars about this too, and it seems that the the, the word so people think that it actually means in Hebrew. So be it. It doesn't actually mean that. There's actually words that mean so be it in Hebrew. You can just say so be it. And, and then the question is, if that's the case, then this translations so be it. Why does it translate to amen? Why does it have to be amen? If the word means so be it, then shouldn't we translate it as so be it? But it but it doesn't. It state it amen is a word that has its own meaning. It has its own it's its own entity. So I think that there might be something going on there. Like I said, it's a hypothesis. Um, yeah. What do you guys think about that? Oh, thank you, dude. Edgar, Edgar Caesar just became a member. Thank you, dude. I really appreciate that. Welcome. Welcome to Gnostic informant. You have just attained true Gnosis. You have been saved from the Demiurge. You have just became one with the Pleroma. You are in the stars now. Now you are deified. Apotheosis. That's... (laughs) Thank you, dude. Uh, the super chat. I want to go back to that real quick before I get to the next. I, I have some more. We're going to get back into the text in a second. I have some more interesting stuff I want to point out. Yakubi Itzrim says, does Plutarch know about the Christians? That's a good question. Because I know he's written, he's written so much that I've barely touched. The, I barely scratched the surface. He's written hundreds and hundreds of books. And a lot of them are still available. Like, for the ones that aren't available, who knows what he was writing about? Now, if the, if he was writing about the Christians, those are the texts that are probably would be preserved before the other ones. I don't know. I'm just going to look it up because that's a good question. I don't see anything. Yeah, not that I know of. And the thing about Plutarch, Plutarch is, okay, he's born in 46. He dies in 119. So he had to have heard of him, at at least towards the end of his life, because 
around 119 when he died is when Suetonius and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger are writing their stuff. And that's when Christianity is just being becoming a sort of a, a known thing in the Roman Empire. He had to have heard about them. I don't know if he wrote anything about them, though. But he had to have known. Yeah, we're, we're talking about second century, this, the 20s almost, second decade in, in the second century. He had to have heard of them. As far as did he write anything? I don't. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But I wouldn't be surprised if he did because that is late. He had to have known something about them. I'd be shocked if he didn't. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe someone in the chat can answer that for him. Um, so let's keep going. And any other super chats that are be very, very uh, appreciated. So let's get back to the text. The other one I wanted to show you was this one. Obviously, I can't read the whole thing. We'd be here for hours. It'd be here for a day, a full day. All right. It's not that long, though, actually. It probably wouldn't be. I mean, it's not that long, but it's not short either. So this is number 42. It says, it is fabled by the Egyptians that Osiris' death happened on the 17th day of the month, mouth, at which time it is evident that the moon is at its fullest. For which reason the Pythagoreans call that day antifraxis or disjunction. Now, this is, we, I was talking to Jason I was talking to um, uh, Esoterica about the uh, Justin Sledd. I said, Jason, I was talking to Justin Sledd, Dr. Justin Sledd about this. And the, the Pythagoreans were obsessed with numbers and perfect numbers. And they even murdered another cult member for implying that there, there was a number that wasn't perfect or something. Along, I can't remember what he said, but there was like something crazy going on there. So this is funny right here. The Pythagoreans call it a disjunction and they utterly abominate that very number. For the middle number 17 Failing, falling in between the square number 16 and the oblong parallelogram 18, which are the only pure plane numbers that have peripheries equal to, with their areas. Disjoins and separates from each other and being divided into unequal proportion, portions. It makes this sesquivative proportion 9, 8. <laughs> this is crazy. Like, I just wanted to show you. The reason why I wanted to show you this passage right here is because... This fact that people are thinking of this type of stuff when they're recording their mythologies tells you a lot about the time period. The Pythagoreans, the the Platonist, you know, Plutarch was considered himself a Platonist. Uh, P Platonists were kind of borrowing from the Pythagoreans a little bit too. And there's all this number stuff going on, and I think it, I just think it's interesting how Plutarch is just like. Yeah, the reason why he's, he died on this day is because of a of a number not being perfect. Like, and that makes you wonder. Then it begs the question: What if the the Bible has stuff like this in there? Because you have all these weird passages, like with the fish coming out of the bat, um, coming out of the uh, whatever you call it, the the uh, the basket or whatever the the bag. And it's like this, like Pythagorean numbers happen in there. And I don't know. I, I think Osiris and Isis have a lot to do with influencing Christian theology, especially when you look at Philo. And we're going to, I'm going to do another one of these with Philo at some point. Uh, oh, I forgot to take away this super chat. Sorry. I want to do one of these dig in with philo one of these days philo writes insane stuff dude he is writing down what literally looks like christian theology with, without jesus like he's talking about there being a trinity and the logos and heaven being handed down to the sun and all this crazy slick christian lingo from a hellenized jew living in alexandria and that's why i like looking at these texts because it gives you it tells you that the setting was like of what these myths are about. There's layers happening. Now, is there a possibility that Plutarch doesn't even know what he's talking about? And he's making all this stuff up about the, about the Egyptian religion? Possibly. I don't think he would... It doesn't really make sense that he would do that, but it's possible. I mean, it is... It's not like he's the authority on Egyptian religion. He's living in Delphi. That's the Oracle of Delphi. He's the high priest of Delphi. 
So I'm sure he knows a lot about religious religious cults and and you know um, stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some truth to this. And so it says Osiris's burial next it into an arc and fashion like a crescent because the moon, when it joins the sun, becomes the first of that figure and then vanishes away. Likewise, the division of Osiris into 14 parts sets forth into a symbolic the number of days into which the luminary is decreasing from the full to the change. Moreover, the day upon which she first appears, Isis, after she hath now escaped the solar rays and passed by the sun, they term imperfect good, for Osiris is beneficent, and as his name hath many other significations, so what they call effectuating and beneficent force is none of the least. Wow. Now, when I first read this, the first thing I thought about was, there's, a you know, you get people who, some scholars who think that there's some, there's some uh, influence of Osiris in the story of Joseph going down to Egypt and being basically in the underworld, which is the dungeon. And I thought about this and I was able to pull up a, another, I was able to pull up something from the Epic of Gilgamesh that I think ties into this as well. So let me just pull this down for a second. And I want to show you guys one more thing. Here it is. All right. So here it is. It says. Here it is. Ishtar. So, so Gilgamesh is um Gilgamesh is <laughs> this is by the I just gotta say this real quick. If you haven't read the Epic of Gilgamesh, do it tomorrow. Do it as soon as possible. It's the greatest thing that ever written. It's I'm not kidding. It's one of the best literary pieces ever of all time written. It's so good. And the way they, they make you really like Gilgamesh. He's this great good looking guy. He's sort of like kind of a dummy, but he's sort of like he just he's like a good hero. And Ishtar comes down to him. And uh, she wants to get with him, right? And so <laughs> he starts talking. He starts talking shit. Like he's like, he goes, "If I take you in marriage, what gifts could I give in return? What ointments of clothing for your body? I would gladly give you bread and all sorts of food, fit for a god. I would give you wine for a wine fit for a queen. I would pour out barley to stuff your granary. But as for making you my wife, that I will not. How would it go with me?" So if you have to know, for this to make sense, you have to know the previous myths of Ishtar and Dumuzi and Ishtar and uh, Ishalanu and all this bad stuff that happens to all her husbands. And Gilgamesh knows this stuff. So he says, your lovers have found you like a brazier which smolders in the cold, a back door which keeps out neither squall of wind nor storm, a castle which crushes the garrison pitch that blackens the bear, a water skin that chest, he just goes on with all these he says, what shepherd of yours has pleased you for all time? There was Tamos, the, the lover of your youth. For him you decreed wailing after a year. You loved the many-colored roller, but still you stuck and broke his wing. <laughs> he just goes on and on and talks about all his her horrible marriages. So then Istar goes into a bitter rage, went up to high heaven, tears poured down in front of her father Anu, and she says, Father Gilgamesh, has heaped insults on me and told me all about my abominable behavior and hideous acts. And she says, basically, she's like, give me the bull of heaven. I got to send him down to kill him. <laughs> she wants to kill him. So, and then this is where I wanted to, this ties back to the Joseph and Osiris thing, because there's a really strange passage in here where he says, she says, uh, if I give you the bull of heaven, um, I will break the doors and hell will smash the bolts. There will be confusion of the people, those above with those from lower depths. I shall bring up the dead to eat food like the living, and the host of dead will outnumber the living. Anusa, or Anu said, that's a typo, Anu said to great Ishtar, if I do what you desire, there will be seven years of drought throughout Uruk, when corn will be seedless husks. 
Have you saved grain enough for the people and grass? Ishtar replied, I have, seen, I have saved grain for the people, grass for the cattle, seven years of seedless husk. There is grain and there is grass enough. Now, that just reminds me of the passage of Joseph when he interprets the dreams. And there's going to be seven years of famine. And so he tells Pharaoh to get ready for seven years. I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch, but it's just like, it just, just stood out to me. Like a lot of, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of bowering motifs happening in the ancient world. There's another super chat that I just saw. I'm going to get to that right now. Oh, there's a couple of them. Wow, guys. Thank you. All right, here we go. Sherry D. How's it going? Thank you for the super chat. You seem to enjoy etymology. I recommend Anacalypse. Question. Were Christians called Christians this early on during the life of Plutarch? It's a good, that's also a really good question. You know what? I love that question, actually, because even though the even though Paul, or I guess it's Acts, says that Antioch is where Christians first called themselves Christians, you gotta wonder if that was happening across the Roman Empire. And I'm, I've also come to the conclusion. I want to. I was gonna get to this actually. I have a new theory that the Christian religion was trying to be universal from the beginning, especially the Hellenized, like the Pauline, the people in Turkey. I don't think they were trying to just be like Jews, basically. I think they were trying to be a universalist religion. They were trying to be the true religion. Like, that's what I think they were trying to do. And I don't think they looked at it the way we look at it today. It's like, we're within Judaism and you're within paganism. I don't think, I don't think they saw it that way. I don't even think that the cr term Christian even mattered. It was all about the, the worship, the, you know, the, the practices, the stuff like that. That's, that's, that's what I'm starting to think now when I look at some of this stuff. That's a good question. Pat Slowinger, I want to have him back on if you're still in the chat. We got to we got to talk about this golden ass and the, the the story that he tells us with those with Isis in there is just mind blowing. It's all about salvation. Isis is a salvation deity, and I want to dig. In. I'm trying I'm trying to explore Isis a lot more lately, which is why I'm reading this uh, Plutarch text because there's a lot of nuggets of information in this Plutarch text, but Apollius. In uh, Golden Ass, um, and you, you and I were just talking about this through email. There is so much in there that makes you wonder if Christian theology was borrowing all heavily from not just the cult of ISIS, but like the the um, the the, the, the uh, Hermetic religion of, of of Egypt of of Alexandria. When you read the Hermetica two, translated by M. David Litwa. It's un, it's almost undeniable. It's like you get the father and the father being taught by the son, and I do the will of the father, and the 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 baby born in heaven, and the, who will be like the savior. And there's a lot of this most cr motifs that seem er eerily Christian from a person from our po timeline point of view, like looking back, I guess you'd say, and you look at it because we're we're all we all grew up as Christians. We know the Bible and stuff like that. So when we go to these ancient texts that are older than the Bible and they, they feel Christian to us, our first response is, did the Christians borrow from this? And that I, I, I never use, I, I stopped using plagiarizes because I don't think that's what had happened. I just think that there's, there's, there's ways to do religion. Like there's ways to worship. There's ways to do. It's like when we talk about music, we talk about like different genres and music. There's ways it's done. There's certain, there's certain parameters that have to be done to make a good rap song or certain ways to, for a good pop song or, or whatever pop rock song. And there's certain ways to do it. And it's got to fit a certain way for, for religion to make sense for the people. I think Christianity was just doing what business as usual. This is how religion is done. This is what we do. We eat the bread, we drink the wine. This is what everyone else was doing. I don't think they're copying. I don't think the religion is, 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 uh, I just think that's the way it's done. But yeah, but yeah, Pat, definitely, definitely going to have you on soon. Let's see what else we got. 
Crawford Fulton King. Gilgamesh is my favorite. This is your first stream without your baseball cap. Yeah, I know. I usually like to wear a hat. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I forgot this time. Gilgamesh, uh, uh, I hope you're doing well. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate that. So back to the text. There's a couple of things I want to show you guys. All right. So, yeah, the Pythagorean thing I thought was fascinating because it tells you a lot about the ancient world and their, how, how, how far they're willing to go to, to like construct a sacred text. A sacred text to the people in the ancient world wasn't just writing down history. They, they were really trying to layer it with numerology, with astronomy, astrology, all that stuff. They were trying to like make it magical, I guess you would say. Let's see. This is another one I want to show you. This one gets into Zoroaster and Mithra. So you could see that Plutarch's comparing the cult of Isis, Osiris, the Hermeticist to other places like the, the East. So he says, this is the opinion of the greatest, wisest part of mankind. For some believe that there are two gods, as it were two rival workmen. This is dualism. This is big Gnosticism and Zoroastrianism. Um, two rival workmen, the one whereof they make the maker of good things and the other of bad. And some call the better of these gods, the other, the daemon. As doth Zoroaster the Magian, whom they report to be 5,000 years older than the Trojan times. Zoroaster, now called the one Horamazus or Horamazus, and the other one Araman or Aramanus. And affirm, moreover, that one of them of that one of them of anything sensible, the most resemble light, and the other darkness. This is important because when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a big dualism. There's, there's a lot of dualism happening in Jude in the Judaism religions. I don't know how how you define that. Like you know the the Near Eastern offshoots of Judaism, the Essenes, the um, Sadducees, and so we're reading from the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The people who are the, the maybe they're Essenes, maybe they're not. They're big into this dualism of light and darkness. The the sons of light versus sons of darkness, and that's going to be the end of the world, where there's going to be a war in heaven, which they talk about in Revelation. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> Mithras was in the middle betwixt them, for what caused the Persians call Mithras the mediator. Now, if you know the New Testament, especially in Revelation, they call Christ the mediator, and they tell us that. He, he first taught mankind to make vows and offerings, thanksgiving to the one, and offer averting feral sacrifice to the other. I mean, that's pure dualism right there. But I know a lot of Zoroastrians reject dualism. dualism. They say it's, mo it's a monastic religion. That there's a, a, a first maker source, and then <clears throat> Ahura Mazda and Araman are underneath that. So, I'm sure someone in the comments would probably probably say that already, but you know. So I wanted to show you that because it's pretty fascinating how he's comparing Mithra, the mediator, as being some sort of uh, the first the the first taught mankind to make vows and offer thanksgiving. <clears throat> For they beat a certain plant called Amomi in, in a mortar. And call upon Pluto and the dark. And then mix it with the blood of the sacred wolf. And convey it to a certain place where the sun never shines. And I keep, and I, I've tried, I've been telling people for a long time. Zoroastrianism is not monotheistic. It is in a weird sense that they, they pray to the one God, Ahura Mazda. But within the theology, within their pantheon. Pluto is running the dark. He it says right there, Pluto is in the dark, uh, uh, running the underworld. So he's comparing the Pluto of the uh, horror of the Zoroastrians to Osiris, being the god of the underworld.
Okay, so another one I wanted to show you guys. This one's pretty, <clears throat> pretty weird. This one's really strange. Now the translation I have behind me that that I'm not using has a little bit different wording here. <clears throat> it says, "But Osiris had his name from Osios and Eteros." I said, "I don't think I'm pronouncing it wrong." Eros, Osios and Eros, pious and sacred, compounded, for he is the common idea of things. But if you actually look at the Greek, because the translation, I, I, right away I noticed something was wrong here. I, I looked at the Greek, the words logos. So the translation, this guy, he translated logos into um, common, common ideas. If, for, if you look at the Greek here, I can't, I can't, hold on, I can show you the Greek, actually. One second. <clears throat> See it? Right there. So the person that translated this version translated it as <clears throat> common idea. Back to the text. <clears throat> Common idea of things. So he's the Logos. Osiris had his name from Osios and Eros, pious and sacred, compounded, for he is the Logos of heaven and things in the lower world, the former of which the ancients thought fit to style Era and the later Osia, which means pious and sacred. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but the principle which discuss, discloses these things heavenly and which appertains, appertains to things which motions tend up to ano is called Anubis. And sometimes he is also called Hermanubis. The former name referring to things above, the latter to things beneath. The reason why I wanted to show you this was one, him, he's called the Logos in heaven. That's pretty crazy. You see that all over the place with these savior type figures, these dying and rising type figures. They're always called the Logos or something, the mediator. And this is another example of that. But what's crazy about it is that there's this sort of motif of what is below is above or what is above is also below. And I think there's... um. I think that's happening in a lot of ancient texts that that are are you know I think it's very prevalent in the in the ancient texts this sort of as as above so below the things that are happening in heaven are happening like <clears throat> like when Josephus talks about the war happening in heaven where when what's happening on earth during that it's Titus is sacking Jerusalem so while Titus is sacking Jerusalem. Michael and his angels are up in heaven fighting against the whatever, Azazel and his demons and whatever you want to call them. Here's another super chat. Make sure I didn't miss any. <clears throat> Please consider reading the story of Nashikita from the Katha. Oh, yeah. I actually have a copy of the I'm not sure if it's all of them, but it's a a uh, uh, selected version of the Upanishad. The audience would like it. <clears throat> His father sends him to the underworld for three days where he meets Yama and attains true gnosis. <laughs> I got to check that out. I, it's been a while since I looked into that. I, I remember reading that and thinking, wow. The, like I remember thinking the same thing. There's a lot of this stuff going on here that are like, well, who's borrowing from who or but like you have to get to the conclusion eventually that it's just how things are done. It's all about the <clears throat> the numbers, the the astrology, the like I was just talking about the as above so below type thing. If, if you want to make something sacred, it has to match the heavens. So the three day motif I think comes from Ishtar. When Ishtar descends down into hell to save Tammuz, who we were just talking about. <clears throat> It takes her three days to go down there 
where she's taking down a layer of clothing. She goes through seven layers. And on the fourth day, she rises and brings Thanos back with them. And the dead come up with her. Um, we were. T- <laughs> What's crazy about that is we were just talking about Joseph in Egypt in the dungeon. And I'm just going to pull it up so I don't get it wrong. There's another three-day motif happening there, too. Yeah. There it is. So this guy's in the dungeon with Joseph and he has a dream that so he has a dream that he's confined. Okay. Let me just find the dream. We had dreams, but there's no one there to to interpret them. Joseph says, sure. I'll interpret them. The chief cupbearer told Joseph that in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches. It barely budded when it blossoms came out, and its clusters, clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, pressed them into his cup, and put it in Pharaoh's hands. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your post. So there's that motif of like being risen after three days. You see, there's something going on with that. And I think it comes from the Ishtar. I'm not saying Ishtar is the first one. Ishtar is the oldest one I could think of that has that three-day motif in there. But you see with Jonah, Jonah's in the belly of the whale for three days. And then on the fourth day, he rises out of it. So yeah, um, which one is it? The Katha Upanishad. Let me see if I have it in front of me. I do actually. Hold on one second. Now, I don't know if this has everything in there, but this is like a, some selections. I, the Katha was one of them for sure. Katha. <clears throat> this is the translation I'm using right now. It's a little tiny, little tiny guy. Okay, I think I, I, I might have found it already. King of Death, maybe? Okay. The three worlds are the sky, the earth, and the netherworld. The father of the spirits of the meritory is dead who dwell in another world, reaping fruits of their good deeds, but subject to rebirth. Yeah, I'm, I might have to look back into this and try to find it because there's a lot in here. Yeah, one of these days I'll have to um, look through this and try to find what you're talking about, because that does sound really interesting. Like a Vedic, a Vedic text, especially as old as the Upanishads, having that three-day underworld motif happening there. 
that would be kind of mind blowing. So I'll have to look into that. So back to these, back to the Osiris thing. Now he talks about Serapis at the end of this. Now, Serapis is relatively new compared to Osiris. Serapis comes after Alexander the Great. And then he says that the Greeks, Hermes, the books of Hermes, there is an account. So he's talking about the Hermetic religion already. There is an account given about the sacred names and that power which presides over the circulation of the sun is called Horus. The Greeks call it Apollo. <clears throat> and that which is over the winds and is by some called Osiris and by others Serapis. And by others again in the Egyptian tongue, Sothi. Now the word Sothi signifies in Greek to breed and breeding. And therefore, by an application, the, the word, that's like some, some weird uh, Egyptian type of Greek. The star which they account, the star which they account proper to the goddess Isis is called, is it Kuan? Kuon? Is that my reading now? I can't even see. What is, I don't even know what that letter is. It's like it looks like it's like uh, Egyptian or something. Is that Kuon, I think it is. Which is a well dog as a breeder. And although it be but a fond thing to be over contentious about words, yet I'd rather yield the Egyptians the name Serapis than of that Osiris, since I account the former to be foreign and the latter to be Greekish. But I believe both appertain to one God and to one power. But we also know that Serapis is a combined deity of the Apis bull and, and Osiris. I wonder if there's a connection between the Apis bull and the bull of heaven. And then, get, then that would tie it to Gilgamesh and Mithra. So, so here's another thing I wanted to, I wanted to uh, point out: <clears throat> mournful sacrifices. If we are never to admit what laws prescribe us, nor yet to confound and distract our thoughts about the gods. There are among the Greeks also many things done that are like those what the Egyptians do at their solemnities, and much about the same time too. For at the Thesmophora at Athens, a woman fast sitting upon a bare ground, the Boethians also removed the shrines of Achaea or Demeter, Determining that that day the afflictive holiday, because Demeter was then in great affliction for her daughter's ascent to hell. Here's that same motif in the Greek. The Illusionary Mysteries is just a, a, a Greek version of the Ishtar Mysteries in Sumerian. It's just a Greekified, Hellenized version of that. And it just like um, the reason why I'm showing you all this is because I'm trying to highlight how important this was to the ancient world this sort of repurposing old older myths for a new time period with a new person with a new prophet a new god a new nation a new empire and that's just how things were done and you had to polemicize the former to make you the real deal like you had it had to be done that way for whatever reason and um so my theory is this. I look at the Old Testament, right? And I see I see like retellings like Joseph in and we were just talking about Joseph. But not just Joseph. You look at the story of Esther and Mordecai. And it just screams at you Eshtar and Mor and Marduk. And not even just because of the names. When you read the text, the three day motifs in there too. Esther on the third, Esther, Esther's praying for three days. And on the fourth day, her prayers are answered and she saves Mordecai, 
who's like another it's just it's just, it's just really obvious when you compare like you could just kind of tell but i don't but i don't think that's a bad thing for judaism i th- i think they're really trying to hold on to the ancient rites they're trying to be sacred they're trying to retell an ancient sacred story for a new audience it's like what even going back to sumerian sumerian versus babylonian akkadian stuff they were doing the same thing the sumerian had a version of epic of gilgamesh and then artahesis retells that story and they change the gods and they make the 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 god that used to be the highest god is now not as good as Marduk. Marduk's even better than that God. Well, I think the Old Testament is just a complete catalog of ancient world mythology being you hemorrhize for one. I think a lot of these gods are being told into like characters like Mordecai, Ishtar, or even Isaac and Jacob. And I think they're basically off these pagan gods. Their stories are being retold as Jacob, Isaac, Joseph, Ishmael, all these characters, right? And I think that the ent- the entire Old Testament is just like a retelling of all the ancient sacred text into one spot. I think that's what Ptolemy, when you hear when you read the passage about Ptolemy from Josephus, Ptolemy the first, oh no, it was Ptolemy the second, where he was obsessed with finding all the ancient books, putting them in, he wanted to translate them all into Greek. That's I think that's how you get the Septuagint. That's where you get this whole Bible concept. The Bible is not one book. It's a, it's a library of books. And I think that's what's happening. I think that's, and, and here's, and I, I, I've, I've said this over and over. I think that the new Testament can be in a lot of ways, diametrically opposed to the old. I still stand by that in the sense that there are two different religions, different law codes. One of them, you're, has kosher the other one doesn't like there's a there's a lot of things that are they oppose each other in a lot of ways but the, what the new testament was doing is no different than what the old testament was doing the new testament is t- doing the same thing in greek they're retelling sacred stories of the ancient world to a new audience under a new empire the romans for a new audience hellenized audience and they're if they're taking over what they're they're making the it's like the concept of the new Jerusalem. I think they're trying to basically say we're the new chosen ones. Look, we conquered you. We're the chosen one. If you're the chosen ones, why didn't we conquer you? Why? Because we're the chosen ones, not you. We're the chosen ones. So what they did is they retell the Old Testament, and they instead of having these different books, it just all applied to Jesus. So all these different stories of Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael, you see the pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. This is how this is what they say when I used to go to church. And um, I used to always they used to always tell us how about, we used to always dig into the Bible and read these these like Joseph being sold for twenty shekels, Jesus being sold for thirty shekels, or uh, Abraham offering his only begotten son. You know, like these, they were, we were seeing pictures of Jesus in there, right? But really, what it's doing is the the New Testament's drawing from the old and repurposing it for Jesus. And but it's that they're not doing anything different than anyone else. This is this this is the way sacred texts are written for thousands of years. You you retell a story, you retell the story as above, so below. So you have these layers of Gematria or astrology or whatever. And it's not that much. I'm not saying it's all coded stuff. It's not like it's it's that much. Like it's not like all of it's astrotheology. But I think there's some of that there. And I think that's just the way things were done. So there's a couple more things I wanted to show. I think it was, was there another super chat or no? Oh, yeah, this is what I want to show you. 
So he talks about the sacred vestments that of Isis is partly colored and of different hues. All right. Think about that. What does that remind you of? The, 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 the many colored coat of Joseph. Sacred vestments of Isis, partly, party colored, different hues. Joseph's wearing a coat of many colors. For her part is about matter, which becomes everything and receives everything as light and darkness, day and night, fire and water, life and death, beginning and ending. And that of Osiris is, um, has no shade, no variety of colors, but one simply one. Resembling light, for the first principle is untempered. For that which is first and intelligible, nature is unmixed, which is the reason why. But those of Isis are often used for sensible things when they are daily use and familiar to us. Afford us many opportunities to display them and see them in various mutations. For which, for which reason, both Plato and Aristotle call this part of philosophy by the name of the apoptic or mysterious part, intimate, intimating that of those by help or reason have got beyond those fanciful mix and various things mound up to that first simple and immaterial being. And when they have certainly reached the pure truth about it, they believe they have last attained complete philosophy. That's deep right there. And then he goes on to talk about how Osiris becomes the king of the underworld, like the Greeks call Hades or Pluto. And he's just what he's doing. He's comparing and contrasting the way things are done in different parts of the, and he's basically talking about Egypt, but he's also talking about the Zoroastrians and the Phrygians. He's talking about everybody. He's comparing and contrasting how it's all done. The kaifi is a kind of composition made up of 16 ingredients. Honey, wine, raisins, kyperus, rosin, myrrh, aspalus, sesily, mastic, bitumen, nightshade, dock. The sacred books are read to the perfumers all the while they are compounding them. This is great. This is mind-blowing. <laughs> so... Think about this. The sacred books are read to the perfumers all while they are compounding them. As for the number of the ingredients 16, although it may appear important, being the square of a square and making the only square surface which has periphery equal to its area. Yet I must needs say this contributes very little here. But it is contained species, most of which are aromatic properties, that send up a sweet fume an agreeable exhalation by which the air is changed and the body being moved by the breath sinks into a calm and gentle sleep and retains a temperament conductive to sleep and without the disorders of drunkenness as it were loosens and ties like a sort of knot the doziness and intense intenseness of thoughts by daytime and the fantastic part of the receptive of dreams it wipes like a mirror and renders clear with no less efficiency than those strokes of the harp which the Pythagoreans made use of before they went to sleep, charm and allay the distempered and irrational part of the soul. You could finish that off if you want. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but what I'm what I'm getting at is this is what the Pythagoreans and the people in the Orphic Mysteries would do. If I got a cop, I actually have a copy over here somewhere. I don't know where I put it. Of the Orphic hymns. And the Orphic hymns literally tell you which sacred oil to burn while you're saying a certain hymn. So if you're saying a hymn to Demeter, you have to burn myrrh. I'm just making stuff up. If you're doing the hymn to Hercules, you burn a different type of oil. And it's different. It's, it's just crazy how they do. There's so much commonality with religions, with, with rites and rituals. And I don't know. I just like to, I, I'm doing what, I'm basically doing what uh, our boy Plutarch was doing here. 
with this channel. That's, re that's really what I'm doing in a nutshell. I'm comparing and contrasting ancient religions. I just like doing it. I think it's fascinating stuff, but I also think it's important because the reason why it's so important is because right now we live in a time period where we're so far removed from the events of the Bible. But there's still people in America or even other places in the world that think this stuff is literally true. It's not based off anything but literal history. And these are literally what God said to Moses. This was literally what Jesus said to do. And literally the world's going to end tomorrow. And people who live under that mindset, they, they're, they're a net negative to society. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to get too political, but you're, you're not pushing the ball. You're not pushing the, the needle forward. That's all I'm saying. You're, you're holding people back from a better world. And I'm not saying we should get rid of this stuff either. I think we need to start approaching the text for what it is. It is a, it's an attempt to reach a deity, but there's a certain way it's done. And there's bowering happening from culture to culture. And there's an evolution happening over time, starting from the Sumerians, even before that with the Proto-Indo-Europeans and the African cultures. And over time, you get this evolution of religion that ends up being Christianity, Islam, Hinduism. And I think it's I think there's so much there's so much more value in approaching it that way rather than keep being dogmatic and trying to make it fit, trying to put square pegs in the round holes to make it all make it make sense that it's literally has to be true. The world's gonna end tomorrow. We need to make abortion laws. It's just I don't know. That's why I, that's part of the reason why I do what I do, but I also just love to do it. So I just wanted to bring that up. And uh, I thought it was pretty fun. Something we can do for more often is get into text and read them <clears throat> and look at them. Oh, I missed a super chat. Jesus saves. How's it going, buddy? Jesus is Lord. Yep, he is. Jesus is Lord. So is Baal. Baal is Lord. Uh, who else is Lord? Osiris is Lord. Um, who else is called Lord? Adonai literally means Lord. Uh, Lord Anu. I think pretty much every god is called Lord. Lord Shiva. Shiva is Lord. But yes, you are correct that Jesus is Lord, according to the Bible. So I'm not going to knock you for that. And, you know, I think we, I think people who are atheists, I, and I'm guilty of this too, is we, we're, we're hard on people who, we, we forget that people really just are looking to, for hope. Like they, they want that comfort of, 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 re, you know, reflecting themselves to something higher. For me, for example, someone who had an addiction for years struggled with addiction and went into recovery. One of the things that got me clean was believing in a power greater than myself. I know it sounds cringe and cliche, but it actually does. It, it, it actually did work. Now, when I realized that I was the one putting in the work and I was the one bettering myself and applying these spiritual principles that are really just human principles, like, you know, being honest with yourself or helping other people who need, who need help or just doing, doing the right thing, having integrity, stuff like that. Then I become a better person. Then I'm become clean that way. Whereas I, I might've needed that little fake until you make it. I'm doing it for a higher power because I want to be good for the higher power. For some people that just, it just is easier that way. And people like the rituals. People like to work, like you know, put together a sacred rites or you know whatever. If people are pagans. Like people, there's there's a pagan revival happening. I think that's great. I think as long as people keep it personal and not try to make the world into the like, we've got to convert the whole world into what I believe. 
it's just not going to work. You're just, it's just not the right thing to do. It's not, it's not right. You know? So I think we forget as atheists, we, people, we forget that people want to have something to extend their spirit to. They want something to make it feel better. They want to convince themselves that there was something after death. Well, I see my grandparents again, stuff like that. And you can't knock that. You can't. It's, I think, and I'm just being my own personal opinion, I think that we are in the wrong for trying to knock that. I do. I personally do. I think that you're wrong to try to tell somebody that they're, what they're believing is, is just, you shouldn't, you shouldn't even bother because it's all fake. It's all, there's no evidence. Show me evidence. I think it's, I, th- I just think it's a waste of time, but at the same time, what's not a waste of time is defending the truth against people who use, who use the, the possibility of God to use that as against someone's weakness. So you got people who go to church who are, who they, the pastor has the advantage of, I can tell them whatever I want. As long as I tell them that they're, they're saved, they'll listen. And I could just make stuff up. You have a lot of people doing that stuff out there right now. A lot of wicked pastors who are just paying no taxes and, and, and they're all political and they want people, if you vote Democrat, you're going to hell. And they just, they're using this religion to, to like try to, try to make people into, bend people to their own will of what they want. And most of the time, these are people who are not educated, who are just have really bad intentions, who are really negative, who are regressive. And that's the, that th- those, no doubt in my mind, those are the people you have to oppose. And they're, and you are in the right for opposing that, those type of people. But I think the people who are, people who have their personal belief system, it makes them feel better. It gives them comfort. <clears throat> There's no reason to oppose that. I don't see any reason to. And uh, yeah, that'll be it for now. Thank you for everyone that super chatted. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> And thank you for everyone that just watched and liked and commented. Appreciate you too. I appreciate everybody who's here. Thank you for everybody. Just reading some of these comments right now and see if there's anything. Sobek. What's going on, buddy? Take the Bible away and lies are not a sin. Tell a lie and instantly our sins are a sin. And instantly lies are a sin. <laughs> God said the people need to give me a Learjet or take me. <laughs> Dude, you're not wrong. And that's, and that's, a, and that you people, when you tell people that, they're like, oh, come on. They're not doing it. They are. Pastor Kenneth Copeland. You know what he said? He said, I shouldn't be riding around with those demons. Those demons. I got to have my own plane. Like he's calling the common people demons. Like he's higher up. He deserves better because he's a pastor. I personally know pastors in my city that I, I knew from the network when I used to go to church. Who are just completely hypocritical. Like they they don't. They've never had to work at, like a real job. Like they, their their father was a pastor. The church got handed down to them. They just get handed down this entity of money machine, money, money, money. You only got you only got to go to church twice, maybe once a week, for an hour. Give a little sermon, read a couple passages of the Bible, and you have your nice life. Of you have a nice home. You know, like you don't you don't got to worry. You got bills. Your bills are paid from the church. And then this, these same people are like, oh, we shouldn't have welfare. People should people should need to light a fire on their other ass. That'll make them better. They, the welfare is so bad. Uh, it's like you are literally the king of welfare. You don't have to work. You have to just go to church twice a week like everyone else in the church. You're doing the same amount of work as everyone else that's going to your church. But you're the one that gets to pay the salary from it. So it's like, I'm not saying that pastors shouldn't have political ideas, but it's like, I don't know. What do you do with that? And they're not educated. They don't need to, they're not going to college. Why would I go to college? I got a free, 
I'm a pastor and I have my own church. I'm good. I don't need college for, I don't need that. So it's like, yeah, that's, that's a reality. But, um, and, and that's, and that's a fair point. Like those are people who should be opposed. Like we shouldn't just be like, I just respect all religions. I think there's a, there is a, there is a gray area, but there also is a line where people cross where it's like, your religion doesn't get to make your life more important than someone else's life. You know, if that makes sense. So I try not to be too critical of, of people who are religious or spiritual, but I also, I'm not going to hold back when it comes to the Kenneth Copeland's and people like that. <clears throat> but yeah, guys, this was fun. We'll definitely do this again soon. I got another video coming out for you guys probably tomorrow or the next day that I've been working on. It's pretty, you'll see it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but you'll enjoy it. Trust me. And uh, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.